Now we jump to chapter 17. Thirteen more years pass. What is the life of faith like? Well, it involves waiting a long time for something we want now. It involves enduring a lot of days when nothing seems to happen. When we're tempted with the thought, of the, with the thought that maybe God has forgotten us. We don't really blame God, we, or we ought not to blame God, we shouldn't blame God, but sometimes we think, well, maybe I got it wrong. Maybe I misunderstood Him. Maybe I'm waiting on something that He really never promised to me. So it's possible that 13 years passed before God ever heard, before Abram ever heard from God again. He has no Bible. 13 years. Now here's a question we have to ask. How long does God get? How long does God deserve your patience? At what point is God no longer worthy of your trust? After a month? After two months? You know, the children of Israel reached the 40-day mark when Moses was on the mountain and said, that's enough. That's too long. We don't know what happened to him. Now we're going to do what we want to do. One of the greatest tragedies in the Old Testament. So they begin to worship a golden calf. Well, how long do we wait on the Lord before we begin to worship a golden calf? I remember talking to a man who'd left his wife. He pretended to be a Christian. He left his wife and he moved in with another woman. And I went to see him. I tried to call him to repentance. And he said, there's just no payoff in this life if you're a Christian. You just don't get to have any fun. That man was very athletic. He was very small. He looked like somebody who would live a long time. He dropped dead on the golf course. He was 40 years old. How long should we wait on, on the Lord? How long does He deserve our, our trust? Well. By the time he was 29 years old, Abram had waited 24 years. And apparently he had waited 13 years before he ever got another word from the Lord. 24 years? I mean, when God first called him, he was, he was too old. When God began, he was too old. And after beginning, when God is too old, excuse me, after beginning when Abram is too old, he then waits 24 years. Can you imagine? It's never too late for God. And it's never too late for you to start doing the right thing. Don't worry about doing the wrong thing in the past. Leave it at the cross put it under the blood and begin to trust God now. Well, somehow Abram was able to trust God all along. And uh, there are three huge events that take place in Genesis 17. When you think of Genesis 17, I want you to think of these three great things. God appears to Abram again at the beginning of chapter 17, he says, I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you. I will multiply you exceedingly. Now, here's the interesting thing. He says, I'm going to change your name. And that must have been a great relief to Abram because you know what Abram's name is? You know what Abram means? 
It means exalted father. Can you imagine living for 99 years and telling everyone who asks you that your name is exalted father? And then what's the next question after they find out your name? Ah, exalted father. How many kids do you have? Well, I don't have any kids. Well, by the time he was 86, he could have said, well, I do have this child called Ishmael, but that's not a child that I have with my wife. Can you imagine? Let's say someone meets me and they say, what's your name? And I say, my name is Slim. My name is Small. Really? Your name is, yeah, my name is Small. My name is Slim. So then one day God comes to me and says, you know what, I'm going to change your name. And I say, wonderful. I'm tired of being embarrassed. Lord, what will my new name be? And he said, your new name is going to be very, very slim. Very, very small. And I say, what? That's what happened with Abraham. Abraham's name meant exalted father. And you know what God says? The day has come, Abram, when you get to change your name. Really? What will my new name be? Your new name will be Father of the Multitude. Oh, no. How embarrassing. Father of the Multitude. I didn't have any children. Well, I've got this Ishmael guy over here. Okay, so uh, God requires such faith. God give us a faith whose strength is not determined by how long we've waited. God give us a faith which is stronger in the end than it was in the beginning. Here's the question. Is our faith made strong because we get what we want from God? Or is our faith made strong because we get God? Is our faith made strong because we get what we want from God? Or is our faith made strong because we get to know God? Because we have the privilege of intimacy with Him. You see, our problem is we want the product. We say, Let, let's get to the end of this thing. God enjoys the process. And the, the reality is we pay so much more attention to God before we get what we want from Him than we do after we get what we want from Him. Let me tell you something. If a young woman falls in love with, a, with a, a man but she's not sure that he loves her, she pays a lot more attention to God, attention to God until she marries that man. If someone cannot have a child, they pay a lot more attention to God until they have a child. If someone is hoping for a job but they don't know they're going to get the job, they pay much more attention to God. If someone has a sick child, they have, pay much more attention to God than they pay to God if they have a child who's healthy. The fact is, when we get what we want from God, we don't pay a lot of attention to God. God wants us to pay attention to Him. God wants us to look to Him. God wants us to know Him. God wants us to love Him and to spend time with Him. Well, God began late in Abram's life. And after they got started, I'm sure Abram and Sarah expected that in nine months they would have a child. It's been 24 years years, and Sarah is still not pregnant. So God comes to him and he says, I'm going to change your name. Your name is no longer going to be exalted father. Your name is going to be father of a multitude. That's the first thing he does. The second thing he does is he in inaugurates the right of circumcision. Now, this is a little bit hard to talk about with men and women together, but we have to talk about it because it's in the Bible. And it's, 
There's an irony here. I mean, if Sarah is going to have a child, her husband has to be a healthy lover. I mean, can you imagine what's going through Abram's mind? You want me to do what? Yeah, that's what I want you to do. Not only you, but all your children, all your male descendants forever. This is going to be a sign of the covenant between you and me. Amazing. You know, there's a verse in Isaiah 55 that says, God's thoughts are not like our thoughts. Boy, I'll say they're not. You know, there are certain theological formulas which work from right to left, which work from left to right, but they don't work from right to left. God is love. That's true. Love is God. That's not true. We are made in God's image. That's true. God is like us. That's not true. God is not like us. We are made in God's image, yes, but God is not like us. And um, if Abram was choosing a sign of the covenant, I don't think he would have chosen this. But God chose him for it. Now, there's a third thing that happens. The first thing is that his name is changed. The second thing is that circumcision is introduced. The third thing... It's what he wanted all along. If God tells you he's going to do something for you, what's the first thing you want to know? When. When. The first, the first thing Abram wanted to know is the last thing God told him. He told him when. Do you know that Christ is coming back? you know that Christ is coming for you? You know that Christ is coming to make you kings and queens? When? When? I don't know. I don't know. But he's coming. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. Look at verse 21. He names the child before he was, he's conceived. Genesis 17, 21. My covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. He tells him when? Within a year. And they expected that during the first year of their relationship with God. And they got it in the 25th year. This time next year, it says in verse 22, when he finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Okay, there's, a, there's an amazing story which begins in chapter 18 and goes to chapter 19. Chapter 18 is the story of a visitation, an angelic visitation, where three heavenly visitors come to the tent of Abram, Abraham and Sarah. And um, Abraham tries to get them to stay. They're on their way somewhere. And in verse 13, Abraham says, My Lord, if, if now I've found favor in your sight, please don't pass your servant by. He says, Stay here and refresh yourself. Get cleaned up. Take a bath. Have a meal. Rest. Stay here. Don't keep going. He'd been sitting in the doorway of his tent in the heat of the day, and he saw that there were three men standing opposite him. Now, they're called men. Originally, they're called men, but he bowed down to them. He wouldn't bow down to the, down to the king of Sodom. 
but he bowed down to these three, and he asked them to stay. And he goes and he tells his wife, please prepare a meal for these visitors. And, they, and she prepares a wonderful meal. And uh, then they ask him, where's your wife? Well, she's in the tent. Then they say to him, well, one of them says to him, I will surely return to you at the same time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. So, this visitor tells them the same thing, tells Abram the same thing that God told him in chapter 16. Within a year, your wife is going to have a son. Now, Sarah laughed. Sarah was listening at the door and she laughed because she's thinking, I'm too old. I'm too old to have a child. She doesn't really believe the promise. The Lord said to Abraham, okay, here it is now. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, they're called men. Now look at verse 13. One of the men is talking to Abram. And uh, by verse 13, that man is called the Lord. So what can we say about the identity of the three visitors? Well, I would say this. Two of them were angels. And one of them was the pre-incarnate Christ. God the second person. The Lord. The Lord, the Lord. And it says in verse 13, The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I'm so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. So he's told three times. Once in chapter 16, twice in chapter 17. And Sarah lied. She said, I didn't laugh. And he said, oh, yes, you did. You did laugh. God knows how, what we really think of his promises. So what does that tell you? It didn't happen because of her faith. It happened because of his grace. Then the men rose up from there and looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to send them off. And the Lord said, you see, one of those men is called the Lord. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And in verse 20, he says, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done according to its outcry which has come to me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned away from there, verse 22, and went toward Sodom while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. So evidently, one of the three men is holding back while the other two are walking on. And the one who's holding back is God himself. Abraham, okay, now, what is Abraham's concern? Abraham knows what's happening in Sodom. And he knows who these men are. He knows that what's happening in Sodom is unspeakable wickedness. And he knows that these men are completely pure. We've got to stop here because our time's up.